Hey, good afternoon. I got nervous so quickly. <laughs> uh, I'm Jennifer Castle, and um, this is meeting the diverse needs of library instruction, or diverse library instruction needs of HBCU students. Um, Vanessa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to me? Yes, I'm Dr. Vanessa Jones. I am the Technical Services Librarian at TSU uh, down, downtown campus, not the main campus. Uh, of course, we have many other titles. All librarians do. Um, I also help with in, uh, library instruction, uh, for freshman orientation, and what we call a U UNIV 1000 course, which is all kind of like collect, uh, college of success for the freshmen. Yeah, and I'm the instruction and engagement librarian, and I'm on the main campus. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Hey, but by the way, thank you so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's a lot to to come by, especially after lunch. So we really do appreciate you um, hanging out with us this afternoon. And we're going to try to make this as fun as possible. We just, we you see we diverse like this. Yeah, we're going to make this as fun as possible. So, uh, of course, I still cannot hardly see this, but I'm going to try to quote as at these two blocks on my screen. To ask why we need librarians at all when there is so much information available elsewhere is about it's about as since I cannot see it as as if roadmaps are necessary that there are so many very many roads. Does that even make sense to you guys? Why would oh. people ask for library uh, information? It's like why would you? It's just like asking what directions to go. When you're on the road, the blocks are almost gone. They're scooting over. Yeah, there we go. Can you guys see it better? Is that better? There we go. Yes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, uh. so I thought I would introduce the uh, session with that quote. It was a pretty cool quote that I found. So each, we have four different things we wanted to cover. Pretty simple. Um, challenges of HBCU libraries are basically what we're dealing with. Seeking information, basically what everyone deals with, along with diverse information delivery, how we deliver the information, and um, the academic courses, how we put them all together. All right, well, what are some of our challenges at HBCUs? You know, do we, is it a language barrier? Is it a generation barrier? Is it both? Um, does funding affect services? We can say without a shadow of a doubt, funding does affect services. Um, recently, the state of Tennessee um, found that it owes TSU between $151 million to $544 million in land grant funding that we were not receiving over decades. Mm -hmm. I'm going to right there in the um, chat, I'm putting a, a story to the Tennessean that explains um, a bit about it. Also, some background. Um, so, HBCUs, enrollment in HBCUs are up, but they're down um, at, at PWIs, well, or predominantly white institutions. I'm also putting a link in the chat about that. Well, we got another box. Scoop, scoop box. How's that? Okay, there we go. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, well, earlier this, um, this year, well, this academic year, we experienced a lot of students, way more than in previous years, who um, who uh, applied to to Tennessee State University. Um, we accepted many of them, and um, resultantly, we did have a, a, a housing crisis on campus. Well, not on campus, obviously not. So, um, uh, in like thirty six hundred. I'm yeah, sorry, we put more. We put students in local hotels. Um, well, earlier this year, the state comptroller came out with a pretty scathing um, report about how we had accepted too many students and that it was a housing crisis. However, I will say that if we had received that anywhere between 151 million to 544 million dollars, um, surely we would have built more uh, dorms on campus. So just um, a little bit of um, other things that we're going through here at, TS, at TSU, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, um, so, go ahead, I'm sorry. With that being said, that affects, that affects our renovations, which goes to the library, what we can offer to 
uh, the students, the 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 heat, the the air, the books, the technology, so forth. Now we're not out of date, but we would like to be updated. <laughs> it would help uh, tremendously. Um, which is so, go the ahead. library was built in 1972, and we have had um, a recurring roof leak. Um, I think that has probably been going on for more than a decade, um, and it floods. Uh, mostly in special collections, and then when it, once it gets so bad in special collections, it it, it drops down into uh, government documents. So obviously we've been sort of um, we wrestle with that a lot. Um, it can be too hot in the library, it can be too cold in the library. Um, so uh, when we taught our University One housing class in the fall of last year, Oof. it was um, we were on the third floor where our classrooms are located. And it was about 101 degrees. In with, with two or three fans. But, well, we made it. <laughs> we made it. We made it. But uh, these are a lot of the challenges that were, I mean, just in, in terms of infrastructure um, mm -hmm. that we were dealing with at, at TSU. Okay, so what else are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with inexperienced students. Um, many students, like K through 12 students, K through 12 schools just don't have libraries. So when we meet with them, their freshman year usually, and uh, you know, English 1010, um, when we ask them, do you have any experience with a library? Most of them don't. Either they, they've never really accessed a public library or their you know, high schools or, or, or middle schools or elementary schools don't have libraries either, um, which is kind of a big deal. <laughs> you know, according to a 2019 um, um, survey by school library journals, um, information literacy and college readiness survey it, uh, responded by high school students, uh, high, high school librarians estimate that 69% of their 12th graders are college bound, but only one in four reported that their high school libraries have set goals for preparing students, <clears throat> excuse me, for college research. Um, you know, the students obviously should be getting these, these skills early, but a lot of high school students don't have librarians as a result of uh, budget cuts. And then not only that is, um, you know, this how the, library, the public library schools are now. So dealing with that and a, a librarian coming into that setting, like I didn't sign up for this, or they're pushing the librarians to teach more than being a librarian per se. Um, this is from my own experience because I taught one year for pre K through eight, so I I know the experience that they have to deal with. Not only that, we can we just have it in the news right now. The kindergartner, not the kindergarten, the third graders have to retest their T because they don't put the T cat or whatever, so they can move on to the next level. So if we're dealing with this new generation that's getting ready to come in. They don't even know how to read. So it's it's a big thing from all the way from pre-K, probably all the way up to 12th grade, and they're just passing them along. So they don't even know how to read. It's Imagine them coming into a public uh, a academic library or a public library setting. So we have to prepare that as far as library instruction goes, which goes to the cultural differences. Students must feel engaged so they will learn and feel empowered. So they've, they want, we got to make them feel like they're, they're in college, but they already have to deal with their classroom setting. So we don't want to make them feel like they're, um, as we're teaching them things about the library and make it fun. And this is what pretty much what this presentation is about is working together and making it fun. So I do want to take a, a moment right here to talk about, just to give a shout out to that um, presentation on empathy earlier today, mm -hmm. that really spoke to, I'm sure to mm -hmm. both of us, that um, exhibiting empathy, showing empathy to the students here at TSU uh, is really the biggest way to connect with them. Mm -hmm. There are was... cultural differences because there is a significant um, percentage of the students here are, in, are international students. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are, you know, we struggle to, we need to keep up and meet with their needs because, you know, culturally how they were, even just in terms of uh, citing sources is very, could be very different from what we're doing here in the United States. Mm -hmm. These are things that we are, all, these are things that we are facing here at HBCUs. Now you may be sharing these things also at PWIs, but specifically, um, this is exactly what we're going through at TSU. 
like I had one student to come in where he wasn't a student anymore. He was he graduated, but he's um not from here. And he wanted to he wanted a hard copy of um English to French dictionary or French to English dictionary. It's like we don't have it. We have it online. We don't have I didn't have we didn't have it on this campus, on the main campus. And we have it online. And I was asking, what was the difference? And what it is is when it's it's easy to have it in hand because when you're trying to type that letter A with the little symbols above it, you there's not a key for that. So you have to find it. So he would prefer to have it in his hand. So it's different things like that you have to do with challenges like that. Besides the language barriers, it's actually physically seeing the words. That That's the issue too. So we're gonna play this video for you. Hopefully you can hear the sound. I did check it, so let me, let me test. So I teach college students about inequality and race in education, and I like to leave my office open to any of my students who might just want to see me to chat. And a few semesters ago, one of my more cheerful students, Mahari, actually came to see me and mentioned that he was feeling a bit like an outcast because he's black. He had just transferred to NYU from a community college on a merit scholarship, and turns out only about 5% of students at NYU are black. And so I started to remember that I know that feeling of being an outsider in your own community, partially what drew me to my work. At my university, I'm one of the few faculty members of color, and growing up, I experienced my family's social mobility, moving out of apartments into a nice house, but in an overwhelmingly white neighborhood. I was 12, and kids would say they were surprised that I didn't smell like curry. <laughs> That's because school is in the morning and I had Eggo waffles for breakfast. <laughs> Hurry is for dinner. <laughs> so when Mahari was leaving, I asked him how he was coping with feeling isolated. And he said that despite feeling lonely, he just threw himself at his work, that he built strategies around his grit and his desire to be successful. A mentor of mine is actually Dr. Angela Duckworth, the psychologist at UPenn, who has defined this stick to of grit as being the perseverance and passion for long-term goals. Angela's book has become a bestseller, and schools across the country, particularly charter schools, have become interested in citing grit as a core value. But sometimes grit isn't enough, or especially in education. So when Mahari was leaving my office, I worried that he might need something more specific to combat the challenges that he mentioned to me. As a sociologist, I also study achievement, but from a slightly different perspective. I research students who have overcome immense obstacles related to their background. Students from low-income, often single-parent households, students who have been homeless, incarcerated, or perhaps undocumented, or some who have struggled with substance abuse or lived through violent or sexual trauma. So let me tell you about two of the grittiest people I've met. Tyreek was raised by a single mother, and then after high school, he fell in with the wrong crowd. He got arrested for armed robbery. But in prison, he started to work hard. He took college credit courses. So when he got out, he was able to get a master's, and today he's a manager at a nonprofit. Vanessa had to move around a lot as a kid, from the Lower East Side to Staten Island to the Bronx, she was raised primarily by her extended family because her own mother had a heroin addiction. Yet at 15, Vanessa had to drop out of school and she had a son of her own. But eventually, she was able to go to community college, get her associates, then go to an elite college to finish her bachelor's. So some people might hear these stories and say, yes, those two definitely have grit. They basically pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. But that's an incomplete picture because what's more important is that they had factors in their lives that helped to influence their agency or their specific capacity to actually overcome the obstacles that they were facing and navigate the system given their circumstances. So allow me to elaborate. In prison, Tyreek was actually aimless at first as a 22-year-old on Rikers Island. This is until an older detainee 
took him aside and asked him to help with the youth program. And in mentoring youth, he started to see his own mistakes and possibilities in the teens. This is what got him interested in taking college credit courses. And when he got out, he got a job with Fortune Society, where many executives are people who have been formerly incarcerated. So then he was able to get a master's in social work, and today he even lectures at Columbia about prison reform. And Vanessa, well, after the birth of her son, she happened to find a program called Vocational Foundation that gave her $20 biweekly, a Metro card, and her first experiences with a computer. These simple resources are what helped her get her GED, but then she suffered from a very serious kidney failure, which was particularly problematic because she was only born with one kidney. She spent 10 years on dialysis waiting for a successful transplant. After that, her mentors at community college had kept in touch with her, and so she was able to go and they put her in an honors program. And that's the pathway that allowed her to become accepted to one of the most elite colleges for women in the country. And she received her bachelor's at 36, setting an incredible example for her young son. So what these stories primarily indicate is that teaching is social and benefits from social scaffolding. There are factors pushing these two in one direction, but through tailored mentorship and opportunities, they were able to reflect on their circumstances and resist negative influences. They also learned simple skills like developing a network or asking for help. Things many of us, of us in this room can forget that we have needed from time to time or can take for granted. And when we think of people like this, we should only think of them as exceptional, but not as exceptions. Thinking of them as exceptions absolves us of the collective responsibility to help students in similar situations. When Presidents Bush, Obama, and now even Trump have called education the civil rights issue of our time, perhaps we should treat it that way. If schools were able to think about the agency that their students have and bring to the table when they push them, what students learn can become more relevant to their lives, and then they can tap into those internal reservoirs of grit and character. So this year, my student Mahari got accepted to law school with scholarships. And not to brag, but I did write one of his letters of recommendation. <laughs> and even though I know hard work is what got him this achievement, I've seen him find his voice along the way, which as someone who's grown up a little bit shy and awkward, I know it takes time and support. So even though he will rely a lot on his grit to get him through that first year law school grind, I'll be there as a mentor for him, check in with him from time to time, maybe take him out to get some curry <laughs> so that he can keep growing his agency to succeed even more. Thank you. Love TikToks, love TikToks. Well, this video to show that this is not just for HBCU, um, institutions or libraries. It's just, it could be used for every academic library. So uh, diversity is, comes in many ways. Was it visible or invisible? Because you're also dealing with um, what my dissertation was on was students with dyslexia. So that's an invisible one right there. So um, being our librarians, you got to be able to help them as well. So Really important, really kind of, it goes back, never mind, but that, that presentation from earlier today is, is this level of empathy and interest in the students. So they feel like they're a part of a community here. Now, they chose to go to an HBCU because they wanted to go to school with people who look like themselves. Mm -hmm. However, we'll just be honest, um, most of the librarians at TSU are white. And so that can be intimidating for students when they come in. Or despite that their classes are filled with, with, with other black students or other brown students, um, when they come into a library that they may not have any experience with, who's sitting behind the desk, it's a white person. Um, that can be intimidating. So the idea is that we need to meet them where they are. You know, Work as a team. Exactly. Meet them where they are. We can't expect that students are going to come to us. We have to meet them. And really the best way to do that is on like some empathetic or emotional level. So they know that there is some, they have some sort of rapport with us, that it is not um, this intimidating institution that's on campus that maybe they can come in and print some things off, but that's that. Mm. 
which goes for the many questions they always ask. How do you use the catalog? The famous question. Where is that? Yeah. Well, how do I find a book? I heard that before. I'm not sure <laughs> if I, you know, questions like, I'm not sure if I'm in the right place or if you're the right person to talk to, but I'm looking for a book. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, it is sitting on the other side of the desk. It is a little mind blowing because you're like, well, you're in exactly the same place and you're talking to exactly the right person. But <laughs> they don't know. Um, right. And, and so in a way that is a little heartbreaking. So this is a list of people we are dealing with, our generations we're dealing with. We did the international students, what we said, we have a lot of international students here. And I could say maybe some, um, you know that English is not their first language. And not only that, they have a difficulty with English itself. So you're dealing with that as well. Then you got the returning students. You have your, um, your students that come back and they decide to come at later 60, I'm not going to go 40 because I'm going to go 40. But uh, like 50s or 60s, and they decided they want to come back to school. You have, which is, I guess, that's the, the boomers. Those are the boomers. I'm a Gen X right on the end. Uh, the millennials, the Gen Zs are those the ones we have now. But the Generation Alpha is the ones that we're, I'm scared of that's coming. Those are the ones that I'm scared of that, that they are definitely coming. They're coming with a vengeance. <laughs> so you got to be prepared for all of them to come in at one time and how to um, connect with each one of them at one time. And how do we do that? How can we so do those, that as librarians? Those older generations, you know, <laughs> us included, uh, you know, who come back, you know, those non-traditional students, you know, maybe some of them don't have a whole lot of um, experience with using computers. Mm -hmm. But then we also have um, Gen Z students who come in and really all they need know to use is their phone. So maybe they've got a laptop um, to start college, but they don't know how to, you know, download Office. Because some of these students, some of these students would type a paper on their phone. I've seen that. They would do it on their phone. And then when it's time to use a computer, they do not know how. <laughs> yeah, it's but. very surprising. The other day I saw a student who was trying to do, do something in Canva on her phone blew my mind so tiny there's so many parts to camp i can't even imagine doing it on my phone <laughs> but um yeah there's just sort of wild variations that we are dealing with we have a regular student he's a non-traditional student and he's in his 60s um you know he takes a class every semester but and you know almost almost weekly you know we have to sit down with him and um you know help him write out an email or respond to an email so things like that, it's really a wide variety of um, experiences and um, backgrounds for these students. All right. So in that said, we just had to quote, in the, in the old days, our challenge was accessing information. These days, our challenge is create, creating it. So we're trying to maneuver around all of that, trying to understand it all together. But we're going to get through it. <laughs> All right, so seeking information, you know, are they finding a library community here? Are, are, they, are, they, are they going to conferences and, and finding out information? Are these students getting information from student or social groups? We're, we're kind of, we've been kind of curious. And as we mentioned before, there's technology. Well, obviously they're using their phones, but are they using Google? I mean, some are using their laptops. We see they bring them in and then others are, are clearly using their phones. What other technology are, you know, are they using? And what references are they using, especially if they're coming to us and they don't have any experience with, with library sources or library resources, excuse me. Um, where have they been getting sources for papers? Because surely they were doing that in high school, right? We should have added, we should have added TikTok. Right TikTok, there on references. exactly, yeah. we should have added TikTok. <laughs> are they getting it from Wikipedia? Okay. Are they getting it from Siri? Okay. Are they getting it? Well, now we could have added on there. Are they getting it from, you know, TikTok, ChatGPT, <laughs> chat even? Um, exactly, Linda, ChatGPT. Um, and then databases, you know, if, they, if they've never even heard of what a database is before, you know, sort of ask them a lot of their responses are, is it Wikipedia? Well, <laughs> yeah, sort of. Have you heard of Google Scholar? Nope. 
okay, well, let me show you that. Um, so even just getting them familiarized with the databases, that's kind of like an overwhelming thing, you know, because maybe they are using Wikipedia. Again, we don't know. They're coming to us as freshmen, and this is what we're working with. But um, it's, um, it's, I think, in some ways, like, equally um, mind-blowing and then also um, um, heartbreaking because um, they they genuinely come here because they want to do well, but it seems like you know there are a lot of pieces that are missing. That Lack of happen. information. Mm -hmm. And then we are we are dealing with the frustration of the research. Like I said, we want to make as we bring it to you, we want to bring it to them the same way, where they can feel um, have empathy, as we said, make them feel relaxed and make them want to come back to get receive more information on how to research because you're already already going into the classroom they get in this paper you already frustrate trying to figure out the, how to find these sources and if you get a mind uh writer's block they're getting even more frustrated so they want to come to us to try to figure it out which is great because we're in a in a way we're you know librarians are in a unique position where we can be academic support or just support to the students without the you know the grading component mm -hmm. you know, changes you know your relationship with them it's mm -hmm. it's you know so we, how do we make you how do we make the most of that all right so this goes to the student progress you want to be able to understand each student and they understand they retain differently. Like I said, that goes from an um, everyday student to a student with dyslexia. They're going to retain differently. Or a student that has um, not English as their first language and another student that does not have English as their first language. Or a student, Gen Z student versus um, boomers. They're going to be two different ones. Then you have the librarians, one on one accord, working on one accord. You have to be as a team because you're not working as a team. They're, it, they're gonna, it's going to show. It's going to show visually or it's just, are they going to talk about it later or however it may be. Find out what's missing to make it work. Find out what's missing. That's very important. And how to balance the instruction. So um, just to be perfectly honest, there's been a lot of um, turnover at, at the library. And so you know, library, we have not been on one accord um, mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. And so that sort of increased difficulties. Um, you know, some people do it more entertaining than others. And sometimes mm -hmm. these students are, are going to, unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, are, are going to these one slot sessions maybe multiple times, depending on, you know, who their instructors are and who requested it. And um, maybe they're getting more out of um, one session than they are with another. And so that, that's definitely... <laughs> Or mixed information. They can get mixed information, which we will cover too. So now, now that we've got almost full staffing, um, that's we're spending this, the summer trying to, you know, really hammer out and tying everything to the um, the ACRL you know, framework. Mm -hmm. All right. Which goes to Yeah, there's information delivery. Mm -hmm. So what is accessible? Um, well, we are no, uh, I'm sure as you are as well, have all kinds of um, different titles and hats and whatever, you know, we do library instruct instruction, we are, are communication mediators for informational representatives, where the library is a one stop shop, we are liaisons, whatever it is, whatever it, whatever the, it takes for the students to understand, like, we're here for you. The mentors, um, the counselors, the Wusai area. Yeah. <laughs> Something that I, I tell every class that I meet with is, you know, going to college is expensive, regardless of whether, you know, you've got scholarships or not. And, um, you know, the university provides a lot of resources that are included in your in your tuition and the libraries and the librarians are included in that. So get your money's worth while you're here at school. And that um that seems to resonate with them <laughs> to get their money's worth. And so when we tell them about these, um, you know, you can go to the writing center and get a, a, a um, you know, additional help for you know, formatting and, and composing your papers. And, um, you know, if you need, um, you know, a, a emotional support, you know, we have you know, 
services for sort of relaxation health. stations and stuff like that. So, exactly. um, but it's a matter of getting them to understand our role. Mm -hmm. And so whatever it takes, whatever title they want to give us, however it, it sinks into their head, we're totally okay with wearing that, you know, mm -hmm. wearing that label. And these are the things that everyone have pretty much. We have the information literacy instruction. We have e-learn or uh, maybe Blackboard. Some people may have Blackboard. Academic publisher training. All of us should have some type of training. Always pop up like EBSCO. Always have something pop up, something new. Bet it into some some class of some, some shape or form. You're going to bet into a classroom that's an online online course. You have the new student orientation each semester or maybe just once a year. And then you have the database online training as well, which you either get that from a conference or the rep comes in person or online or tutorials. I will say right here that um, TSU's in, uh, embedded librarian program is, is quite strong. Mm -hmm. um, most of us are embedded in at least three classes, but usually mm -hmm. more, um, I think. In the fall, I was embedded in seven classes. The great thing about um, having all of these, um, having an increase in enrollment meant that obviously the university needed to hire instructors, and a lot of them were adjuncts. But a lot of these new adjuncts are coming in with, and they're younger folks, and they're really understanding the value of information literacy and familiarity with library resources. And so they are requesting us to come in and speak with their classes or be embedded in their classes. And so we're really, really expanding. Sure, we can get that link to you, to you later. Um, and for it, but for a quick, um, I'm embedded into um, business information systems and public administration for the graduate department. And, and so like, all of our liaison areas, you know, we would we would get, you know, we get requests mm -hmm. on, you know, I'm, I'm the liaison to the communications and theater and art and music departments. Um, and then also um, the English instructors uh, are Which really is... enthusiastic. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of one shot with um, the freshman classes. So mm -hmm. I think in March I did 17 orientations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's become very popular and we're really happy about it so i help out with that too the english uh one-on-one -on -one courses so we kind of switch that up because we get a lot of requests for the english english comp classes um, embedded like that's pretty much when you're embedded into a class you're you have your own liaison department but at the same time you have requests from other departments as well so the teacher, basically a student will come to you in that particular class, that course, they'll come to you. They don't have to look for nobody. They know they can come to you. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Specifically, I do also want to say about the um, embedded librarian program. You know, we do give the students options to either meet with us via Zoom or in person. And, um, you know, we had kind of gotten used to meeting with everybody in Zoom because it is great. You can look at things together. They don't have to leave their um, their dorms or whatever. But this year in particular, and, and I have to say it's probably because so many of these students were, were at home um, for so long because of COVID that they really wanted to come in and have that personal interaction with us. Um, okay. yeah. <laughs> I tried to set up an appointment with Zoom and they're like, actually, can I just come by your appointment? office like oh mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely <laughs> um which is perfectly great in fact you know the more that they feel like they can come and talk to us um the better it is and so, i'm sure it's and it's that's true universally but um it, you know, particularly with the students here we have at tsu if they do feel comfortable with you it's a win so baden is basically this if i pick one professor um they want me to be in their class they just add me to the role and I will be embedded into that e-learn or Blackboard. And if she want me to present and uh, present like we're doing now, show us slides and present the, uh, how to use the library and so forth, I can do that. And then the students will know to come to me for if they need any help or any questions instead of going around the world to find somebody to talk to. But she can, um, Jennifer will still be, she'd be happy to send you more information on it. No, you'll be, you be contacted the whole semester. 
Yes, you, just, yes. Just to answer your question, so what, um, and it, it varies between the instructors, what, how much um, um, involvement that they want. Mm -hmm. um, some just want you to kind of meet with them and then obviously monitor the class. They will be um, specific chat um, discussions set up for any questions for the embedded librarian. Um, they will also, you know, I usually record a video um, of just an introduction of me and with my information and I will send out in their, you know, their news feed. And then, um, you know, throughout the semester, I will either participate in the discussion boards or I will, you know, monitor the discussion board specifically for the embedded librarian. And um, and then, you know, we can meet with them, either, you know, in person or Zoom. Really, the most important thing that I hope that the students get out of it, at least within the classes, is how they can contact me mm -hmm. more than anything else, because we know that these students are coming in. And it's a lot of information. We know that it's a lot of information, especially if they don't have any experience. But if they walk away from any interactions with us in those sort of classroom settings, it's like if there's anything, if there's anything you can take with you, just know how you can contact me. Um, and so that has seemed to work. Um, just getting an email, just shoot me an email. It's fine. You know, that's a, just starting a conversation. That's what we want. All right. So. Okay, our teaching methods. You have activities, evaluations, and goals. That's pretty much for every institution, I believe. You have activities, it is your regular handouts. Then you have, some people have quizzes. Like I just recently found that we have a free test and a poll test. I did not know that. <laughs> then you have the tutorials, what we were talking about, that you can provide. Evaluations, you can do verbally or online feedback. One of that's that's good for to find out how you're doing for yourself and also what they think the you know the library can benefit or what else we need for the library. And then your goals is in concise and attainable for students that can cater to each generation. Basically, just maybe be as detailed as as much as you can in that amount of time so they can understand per student. If that makes sense, you know we. Those of us who teach that, you know, that college success class in, in the fall, we, we meet before the semester and we kind of talk about, you know, what things worked in the class and what didn't. And so we can sort of support each other. Mm -hmm. And um, and last year, it, and it shocked me that it shocked others. But um, the coordinator of, of these these courses, he said, you know, somebody said something to me recently about how, you know, these students are really just high schoolers. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. They're just high schoolers. I mean, it's their freshman year of college. You got to treat them like they're high schoolers. Sometimes mm -hmm. they need a little bit of hand holding, and that's okay. College Even, can be overwhelming. If you're the first generation, which there are a lot of students here are first generation, yeah, it's scary. I was first generation. I wish that I had somebody just take a moment to say, hey, it's okay. Come on, we can work through this together. Um, that would have made all the difference. Even um, the older, even the older students, they're going to feel like self-conscious being around all of these younger students. So they, they may or may not ask a question. Questions is, you know, you want to be able to make them feel comfortable to come back to you. That you're not the, the hush, the hush librarian. Yeah. <laughs> There's some academic courses, challenge, challenge, challenge. So we were just talking about that um, University 1000 course, but um, um, yeah, go ahead and take it away, Doctor. Okay. <laughs> this is basically showing how do we provide instruction when you have so many departments or so many areas you got to cover. I mean, you know you have your English comp. That's the basic one. But then you have the research, your research courses, literature and education and nursing. That's not the same as English comp. Then you have your graduate your thesis and your online embedded. They that's online. They're gonna absorb it differently. Your college of success and you, of course, doctoral, your dissertation. All of these are different. So how do we work as a team to be able to get this, all the information they need, and work together? But you know. It's like a bubble. How does that mind map? One particular, we're the library, the librarian. But then you got, how do you reach out to the, each one of these and not confuse everybody, be on one accord? How well, do you do that? 
Well, fortunately, we were able to, um, last year we, we launched a brand new um, website for the library and it's far more user friendly. Um, we got the stats recently for its usage for the year and pleasantly surprised that among the highest pages that they accessed was scheduling consultations and um, you know, faculty and, uh, and research guides and um, how to contact us. Those are some of the, the some of the top three of the five pages that they access on the website, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> we're we're moving forward here, but you know, as we were talking about um, earlier, you know, we've kind of been we've been kind of been fighting with one arm behind our backs just because you know we're lacking so much infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I uh, provided our link in the chat for you guys to see the difference. It looks a whole lot better. It was very, yeah, like that makes a difference too. Easy active. access. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, how do we deliver this information? Well, any way that we can possibly do. So we have, you know, obviously one shots. We have embedded librarian program. We have um, we have tutorials that walk them through the you know, the research process. Um, we have research guides. If I didn't say that already. Um, you know, all, a lot of the same things that other libraries are, are using, but um, we also deliver this information as much as possible word of mouth. Anytime that somebody asks us a question about how can I find something, um, this is a teachable moment. You know, are you really looking for a book or maybe you're looking for um, academic journal articles? The idea is that you got to ask them those questions too, which I know is part of the, the you know, research consultations, but um, it can be a lot to sort of pull that information out of the students. So yes, that's a teachable moment. Uh, what, what else is a teachable moment? Well, how do I, how do I find a book? Well, come here and let me show you how to do that. You can come around the, the desk and we'll sit down and I'll show you. This is how you can search for a book instead of me just sitting there behind the desk and finding something for them. The idea is to really kind of walk them through that process. Ultimately, you know, we all want to make ourselves redundant and we don't need us anymore. But yeah, yes, basically we're delivering this information any way possible, mm -hmm. <laughs> any teachable moments that we can find. Do you have anything you want to add, Dr. Jones? No, you good. Okay, that goes back to the curriculum of understanding the library, understanding yeah. the resources. Understanding the research, all of these have some goes back to the freshman orientation, being a liaison, library instruction, research consultation, and thus forth. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I use this. Well, I didn't say I used this. I'm gonna say I got this from my previous employer, and I thought this was the best idea as far as having a print a printed copy of handouts. This is very simple that anybody can use from the English department all the way up to the doctoral program. And uh, I don't know if Scott is in this meeting or not, or Ruth, but <laughs> this is something that we use. And it's, like I said, very simple a handout and they can use over and over again. It just gives the topic. When, they, when you're given this, basically you, when the uh, professor gives you, that you know what's going on. So you're going to give an example of what is it? What is an elephant? That's your topic. What is an elephant? And then you do your thesis statement. Okay, make sure they don't take your topic because students are good at that. They will take your topic and run with it. Then you do your thesis statement. Go down there, your search strategies. You can write down all your search up to five terms. Think of at least five terms. Write them down. Some people don't like to type it. Some people like to write it. So this would be good for them to have on hand. Then it goes down to what type of information that you use. That also helps. Remember that if your professor wants you to use different types of um, ways uh, to search your information, they want you to put it in your paper. This will help them to keep up with that. They can just check it off. I use that check. I use the textbook. I use the printed source. I use the database. I use all these. I can check that off. And then they can put a number beside of how many they use. They can keep up with it as they go. Then it goes to the use the electronic database in the library. Uh, to find the information that goes to the second page they can write it down if they don't know how to email it to themselves as, as we showing them how to do but they're not paying attention 
<laughs> or email it to themselves, they can write it down. The, uh, a brief summary of the top name of the topic and what it's about, and they can look at it later. If this is good, this is good. This maybe I can look at this later. Have something in, on hand that can a printed copy they can keep. I like having a printed copy versus constantly looking online all the time. I like to have both, honestly. Five flash drives, printed copies of everything, a big notebook, and have it online. So yeah. Well. It, this also is going back to the students being, you know, inexperienced that sometimes there is an assumption when they, you know, start these English classes that they do know how to find sources. Again, we were talking about where were they finding them before. Um, so by having them break it down into different pieces can help them sort of build it up later instead of just assuming that they know how to develop a topic and how to find those sources. Um, I think that a lot of um, I think that some of the instructors here at TSU make the assumption that they do already know these things. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes again, they just need they need some hand holding. They know yeah. they have it in them. They just need to be able to see it and written down. Mm -hmm. You know, that they brought, they've thought about the different components and then it, it it makes them more successful. And me, I'm all about using all your senses, even in the library. You gotta see it and hear it and touch it. So can be able to retain as much as information as much as possible. Again, this could be used from English comp all the way to the doctoral program. So it just, it keeps it all together, working as and then working as a team. It ain't scattered all over the place. Well, one librarian says one thing and another one says another. It's just one thing that can be, everybody can use. All right. So, you know, as we were talking about like having some interaction with the students, definitely we're going to get to this Mentimeter in just a moment. But um, um, I, I read an article recently about how we should sort of treat the students as they're coming into the classroom as if it was church um, to greet them and shake their hand as they come in, make them feel like um, they're a valuable member of the classroom team, that they're not just another person showing up and, um, you know, they're just signing their names to check in or, or whatever, that, that, that we have that sort of taking the moment before you get started to check in with them, you know, do a room, you know, take the temperature of the room and talk about, hey, is there anything that you're curious about on campus that you've been, you know, sort of scratching your head about? Um, sometimes those leads to conversations. Sometimes very simple, fun things just leads to um, fun, which makes them also feel comfortable. So when they when they come back to class, they kind of look forward to it. So um, that's the Mentimeter. If y'all want to do the code and well, hang on, let me get the uh, let me get the link. Okay. All right. So um, uh oh. Let me Stop my share and let me share the um, Mentimeter. All right, can y'all see that? Okay, this has been surprisingly um, successful with the students. Let's end the debate of the of age old questions. Yeah. Go ahead and. <laughs> Put in your vote. <laughs> do you prefer puppies or do you prefer kittens? Personally, I I enjoy both equally. You just have to understand that they're very different beasts and you treat them as such. I've been <laughs> I've been cat kitten sitting for the last three days and I'm ready for her to go home. She wakes up, wakes me up by sitting on my face. So yeah. <laughs> so many conversations because so, so many of these students left their pets at home and they're missing them and they've got a lot of opinions of whether cats are better puppies are better and um and it's just lots of fun again it's not um it's not and it's not great shakes it's just a way for them to feel like they're they're part of the community in the class mm -hmm. all right so the next question our final question pancakes or waffles waffles People have lots of opinions about that. Mm -hmm. Waffle Some House. Some prefer the pancakes because they're nice and soft, and others don't like it when it's crunchy on the bits of the waffles. Other folks love it when the little bits of waffle, the little, the little rivulets or whatever, full 
of syrup and other people think that syrup is disgusting. They have a lot of opinions. <laughs> My visit at IHOP, I would definitely get the pancakes. <laughs> I prefer pancakes and salt. All right. Let me go ahead and stop, stop my share here and then we'll go back to the um, right. Okay. Um, I'm sure all of y'all are doing the same things, doing fun stuff like trivia, bingo, and scavenger hunch that they are. Um, they seem to be very popular here at, at TSU. Um, particularly the scavenger hunt. We had a scavenger hunt during our open house um, earlier this academic year, and it was very popular. People got very competitive, um, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Scavenger hunt could also be done, also can be done inside the classroom online. You can give them three random questions, um, and they can help them find find something online, like how do I find a database or Give them a title of a book and they have to write down the call number and whoever turns it in first. So just three basic ones, make it real quick. I'll make it fun. Same thing with bingo. You can do the same thing. Give them five different things for them to look up, five. And then who, when they find those five things, dealing with the online catalog or um, they have to look online and ask the librarian, what floor is the uh, juvenile books or reference book or the government information is on for them to find uh, to answer it, or they might even find it online as well, just by looking on the library website and answering answer that question. They get a bingo, and if you got all five right, there you go. Then you also have trivia. I, my favorite is Kahoot. I think a lot of people are familiar with Kahoot, and that is very fun. And at the end of the day, whoever wins first, you can always give them a little bag of Cheetos or a sneaker or something. There are college students, they stay hungry. So, or a souvenir dealing with the institution, either one. So all of that would be something fun they can do. And that will get them to come back to know you are a person and you are approachable. They can come back to the library. Yeah, so when I do actually venture out of the, when I do venture out of the library, I get a lot of, I didn't know you lived outside the library or I get Miss Castle. Or, I mean, and there's a lot of, I guess, the, <laughs> but, um, but, but that's because we, you know, we, I, I hope it's because we made it fun and they, it was entertaining enough that they remembered me. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, um, like Dr. Johnson says, uh, Jones. Dr. Jones says, excuse me, Dr. Jones, we have Dr. Jones and a Dr. Johnson here. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez. Um, um, you know, keep it simple, make it fun and, and really engage with them and be empathetic. And, and and meet them where they're at uh, are really the biggest things for us. And all three of these can be done in person in the classroom or online. So on their phones. Mm -hmm. You know, they they might be on their phones anyway, so might as well make use of it. <laughs> all right. Well that concludes our presentation and, and we'd be happy to take any questions if we have any. Um,